Welcome back to part two of Troublesome Notions. In our last episode, we talked about the contemporary situation of policing in America. Today, we will take a look at an alternative vision for tomorrow. And now, your host, fake professor of policiology, American Johnson. Hello once again. Today, we're going to discuss our vision for a future without police. I know this is a scary idea for most of you, so before we begin, why don't we go ahead and take a moment to relax. <sighs> Everything's gonna be okay. These are just ideas we're talking about, and entertaining new ideas doesn't have to be scary. Breathe in, breathe out. <sighs> that feels better, doesn't it? Okay. Well, now that we've discussed the history and the current situation with policing in the USA, we can finally discuss the future that police abolitionists want. Do abolitionists want to just get rid of law and order and let chaos reign in the streets? The answer is a resounding no. Police abolitionists don't want to see a world with no consequences or repercussions for harmful acts. In fact, abolitionists want to abolish the police in large part because cops are able to do a great deal of harm without any fear of repercussion or consequences, as we discussed in our last episode. What police abolitionists really want is to build a new system of public safety and security that is actually effective in keeping the public safe. These systems will be rooted in non-violent methods of community organizing and self-government that will actually stop violent crime and protect our well-being before harm occurs, rather than focusing on enforcement and punishment after the harm is already done. As Sarah Jaffe explained in this article on NovaraMedia.com, ideas that suddenly break through to the mainstream have usually been incubated at the grassroots for a long time. Abolition is rooted in a black radical tradition in which the word is used precisely because it echoes the fight for the abolition of slavery, because it calls attention to the roots of policing and prisons and controlling enslaved people. And it's true! Way back in the 1970s, a group of political philosophers, including black activists Angela Davis and Ruth Wilson Gilmore, as well as Quaker Faye Hunting Knopp and communist Jessica Mitford, began writing extensively to argue that we can do better and, in fact, we must if we want any hope for a fair, just, and safe society. As many abolitionists have pointed out, the justification for policing in America is rooted in deep misconceptions about the nature of quote-unquote crime and criminal activity. The popular perception is that criminals are a small but inherently violent subset of society who pose an essential threat to everyone around them, and that the police are the only line of defense against this very dangerous minority. And intuitively, this might seem to make sense on the surface. After all, I'm sure you don't see yourself as a criminal. But you don't have to look hard to see how easy it is for certain people to break the law and get away with it in the USA. Take, for instance, wealthy corporate executives. In 2005, BP was found guilty of violating several federal laws, which led to a massive explosion in Texas City, Texas, killing 15 workers and injuring 180, but not a single executive, supervisor, or shareholder ever faced charges for any of these crimes. During the 2008 financial crisis, dozens of bankers and traders knowingly committed fraudulent activity, which led directly to the collapse of the global economy which affected millions of lives, perhaps even billions all over the world, yet only one single banker in the USA actually faced criminal charges and went to jail for these crimes. There have been countless instances of corporations harming the environment with no repercussions, seeking quasi-legal tax shelters and getting away with it, stealing wages from workers, bribing politicians through lobbying firms, the list goes on and 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 on. But it's not just wealthy elites who commit crimes and get away with them, of course. It's unfortunately very well established that white people will face criminal charges far less often than black people for committing the exact same crimes. And since we know that black people are more likely to be charged and imprisoned and face longer sentences, then again, it stands to reason that many of the people we meet every day, especially in white social circles, are just as guilty of being criminals uh, but they are less likely to be arrested and imprisoned by the carceral state, so they're more likely to be walking around in public free. So only some of us are being killed and imprisoned, while the rest of us get away with it. As Faye Honey Knopp wrote in Instead of Prisons, police act upon a stereotype which accounts for a very marked relationship between class and conviction. The purpose of police activity is seen in a manner somewhat analogous to the forceful quarantining of persons with infectious diseases, to control and suppress the activity of this lower-class criminal subgroup. 
Thus, those who are caught because feared by the police are feared by the public because caught. The notion that crime is the vice of a handful of people is grossly inaccurate. Crime is extraordinarily prevalent in this country. It is endemic. We are surrounded and immersed in crime. In a very real sense, most of our friends and neighbors are law violators. Large numbers of them are repeat offenders. A very large group have committed serious major felonies such as theft, assault, tax evasion, and fraud. Once we accept the idea that most criminals are relatively indistinguishable from the rest of the population, it becomes evident that prisons are full of people needlessly and inappropriately detained and incarcerated. And remember, most killings by police begin with minor crimes, traffic stops, mental health checks, domestic disturbances, or reported low-level offenses. So that means that black people are much more likely to die as a result of these minor infractions, even though white people are also committing them and just not being killed for it. Does that make sense? It means that black people are more likely to die and go to prison for the same crimes that white people are committing. And if you ask me, that's a load of applesauce. Arthur Waskow of the Institute of Policy Studies submitted the following ideas. Forget about reform. It's a time to talk about abolishing jails and prisons in American society. Still, abolition? Where do you put the prisoners, the criminals? What's the alternative? First, having no alternative at all would create less crime than the present criminal training centers do. Second, the only full alternative is building the kind of society that does not need prisons. A decent redistribution of power and income so as to put out the hidden fire of burning envy that now flames up in crimes of property, both burglary by the poor and embezzlement by the affluent. And a decent sense of community that can support, reintegrate, and truly rehabilitate those who suddenly become filled with fury or despair, and that can face them not as objects, criminals, but as people who have committed illegal acts, as have almost all of us. Activist Kelly Hayes calls abolition a construction project because it's more about building productive systems with an emphasis on nurturing communities and preventing harm before it occurs. Communities would invest in teachers and counselors, universal child care, and support for all family structures. Free and accessible public transit, community-based food banks, grocery cooperatives, gardens and farms, and youth programs that promote learning, safety, and community care. For a clearer picture of this abolitionist vision for a future without policing, let us turn now to noted young political voice, Carr of Car TV. Yes? What do you mean it's on? Hey, why did I sign up for this crap anyway? Okay, fine. Let's get it over with. Time to talk to these filthy commies about the future. <clears throat> I'm Carr, and on today's program, we are going to explore the world of tomorrow. Top engineers, scientists, and graphical designers have collaborated to bring you a glimpse of what the future could hold. As we speak, great minds are devoting their lives to improve mankind. Together, we will explore the potential realities of a post-police world. Imagine you, a futuristic motorist, traveling down the road on your way to work at your democratically owned and operated meme factory co-op, and you get into a vehicular collision. Oh no, what is one to do? Well, first, an unarmed traffic safety official will respond to the scene. Once there, after making sure that nobody present requires medical attention, the official will gather the insurance information and vehicle identification numbers involved, and, if necessary, make arrangements for towing of any disabled vehicles. No muss, no fuss. The way traffic in general is handled will be completely transformed. In the future, armed agents of the state will not be necessary to ensure traffic safety. Any unsafe behavior will be issued a warning and a reminder that safe driving is necessary for society to flourish. At the end of the day, the overwhelming majority of driving infractions will never involve any form of criminal proceedings. A properly funded battery of civil services will be available around the clock to ensure that all of society's needs are met without criminalizing the citizenry. Tasks like animal control, responses to substance usage overdose, unattended minors, or natural disasters will have fully funded and well-trained civil servants ready to respond to meet the needs of the populace. 
Why in the distant future we imagine that 90 to 95 percent of social calls won't need a man with a gun to show up at all. But I hear your concerns, bright-eyed future comrade. What if someone presents a threat to the safety of themselves or others? Perhaps someone has become disgruntled and mentally fatigued after their shifts at the bread factory and are becoming unstable. Not to worry. Unarmed local community defense volunteers will arrive on the scene, accompanied by a trained mental health professional to defuse the situation, and if necessary, humanely take the individual into custody for evaluation and treatment. In this space-age society, many of the behaviors that used to be justified to fill prisons will be decriminalized. No longer will there be charges for vagrancy. Instead of sending armed agents of the state to break up homeless encampments, social workers will be sent to provide no-cost housing for anyone who is housing insecure. Community-funded and driven food kitchens and pharmacies will reduce crimes of larceny and petty theft down to almost non-existent levels. All substance use will be decriminalized, allowing those of all stations in life to seek out no-cost rehabilitation without stigma or fear of repercussions. This will also serve to eliminate the dangerous and unregulated black market. Armed response contingents within the communities will be well regulated, properly trained, and accountable to their communities, ready only when immediate threats to public safety arise. Despite all of this, there will be those with antisocial tendencies that can prove to be dangerous to society and potentially beyond rehabilitation. If someone's life is lost to a violent act, Investigators from independent panels of community detectives will respond and ensure that the right people are held accountable. You may be wondering, with the present-day police able to solve a whopping 50% of all homicides and keep their backlog of unprocessed rape kits down to a manageable tens of thousands, at any given time, how on earth could a community-driven safety organization keep up with such efficiency? Well, let's just say I think we can reach that high bar if we really work at it. Those who are incapable of safely interacting with the general populace after efforts of rehabilitation have failed will be humanely quarantined with the understanding that they still have rights and should be treated as such. Forensic scientists, legal professionals, coroners, and investigators will operate independently, all towards the goal of keeping our communities safe. Those of us who envision the future like to ask the question, what if? You can do the same. Ask yourself. What if substance use was decriminalized? What if the material needs of a community were met? How much theft or larceny would occur if you took away the motive to steal? What if undocumented immigrants were met with social workers instead of armed responders? What if sex work was decriminalized? What if workers in that industry were able to seek out the means to report abuses and, if they desired, find a way out of that type of work? What if instead of calling the police, we could provide outreach to the homeless and those with untreated mental health issues? Some may say that our idea of a world without police sounds utopian. Others may consider us dangerously delusional. But know that dreamers like us recognize that our ideal society won't be perfect. There will be flaws. There will be a lengthy period of transition. Mistakes will be made along the way. We won't be able to completely eradicate racism or inequality as concepts. But those of us who can see the true potential of humanity know that we can do better than we are doing right now, and along the way, make an equitable, egalitarian world for all of humankind. Thank you for watching. So you see, it's not that abolitionists want to simply abolish the police and then stop and call it a day. No, abolitionists seek to build new programs that are designed to serve our communities and nurture citizens into better lives, free of imprisonment and criminalization wherever possible. Rather than investing in armed cops to coerce the community through violent strong-arming and the institution of policing, abolitionists seek to invest in community organization and safety programs that will allow us all to live safer, happier lives. This concludes this three-part series on the troublesome notion of police abolition. We hope you've had a safe, productive, and relaxing experience. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next exciting, but not too exciting, episode of Troublesome Notions. If you enjoyed this film, please support us on Patreon. Seriously, it's the only way we can keep making this crap. Okay. Cut. I'm Peter Falk. 
You probably watched a lot of police shows on TV. When a cop gets in a tight spot, what happens? Bang, bang, bang. Bad guy goes down. Cop holsters his 38, goes off to dinner at a fancy restaurant, the end. Stop, police! I'm taking a test for police officers. The film I'm watching shows a recreation of an actual police drug raid. It's a potential shooting situation seen through the eyes of a cop. to take care of the problem without shooting them, without going to deadly force. By having to take their gun and shoot someone with it means that they weren't able to control the situation in a more human and civil sort of way. 